Lord Jesus, um, I need you. Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me. And Lord, you'd speak to all of our hearts, including my own. That you'd strengthen our weak knees, Lord, to walk with you. And Lord, strengthen our hearts to bow down before you. And to be people that listen and are obedient to you, Jesus. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, verse 24, when the Israelite army finished chasing and killing all the men of Ai in the open fields, they went back and finished off everyone inside. So the entire population of Ai, including men and women, was wiped out that day. 12,000 in all. All right? And I've said this before. It may sound very sad, and it is very sad. You know what the scripture says? That the Lord even mourns when sinners pass. Why? Because we learn in the New Testament that it's not his heart that anyone should perish. In fact, that's why he is long-suffering with us. He suffers long with our attitudes, with the way that we are. And when judgment falls, most of the time, it falls after a long time because the Lord is patient. The Lord is patient. And if you remember, he had, given, he had given the Amorites and everyone in that land over 400 years to repent. He constantly went to them and said, do not continue these evil practices that you have in my land. And you might say, hold up, God's land? Isn't it those people's land? Well, if you read in the Psalms, and if you read in other places in scripture, the Lord says, the whole earth is mine, right? Who created it? You know, if I have a back garden, right? And, um, and in that back garden, I have a shed and I put my tools back there. Then all of a sudden rats take over that shed. Does the, does the shed belong to the rats? Now I may abandon it <laughs> to the rats, <laughs> But does the shed really belong to the rats? Did the rats go online and buy that shed? Did they go and make the transactions with all of the solicitors to buy the land? No, because, I mean, ultimately, that land, not ultimately, but on legal contracts, that land is mine, right? I never saw a rat's name on there, on the contracts. They never helped me pay. I mean, I may try to be clever and go collect something from them, only thing I'll get from them is disease, right? Now, I'm not saying, if you're a rat lover out there, God bless you. You need it. <laughs> so I am not a rat lover. My wife knows. There was a rat in my garage one time. I abandoned that garage until my friend came along and said, Dave, you, you need to go in that garage. And I was like, nah, man, there's a rat in there. <laughs> he can have it. <laughs> he can have it all. So, you know, my good friend, he walked into there with me, and he tried to scare me a couple of times. But he's like, oh, rat, no, like, come on, bro, stop it, man. And we finally found that rat. <laughs> he was all the way in the back corner. I've never seen him again, praise the Lord. Thank you, I'm friends in the room here. And uh, he knows he likes to scare me by making believe there's rats around the corner and stuff. Won't give any names, but Michael Dorsch, you know who you are. <laughs> All right, so we'll keep moving along. So, um, so that entire population uh, of AI is wiped out. And um, like I've said before, a, a lot of times we view it and we say, oh, look at the slaughter of all these innocent people, right? Um, no, actually, it was the judgment of God on an evil society that had propped itself up in opposition to God after he had warned them and told them, no. Now, at the end of the day, they could choose to be rats in the shed or they could choose to be children of the Lord. It's our choice. You know, like C.S. Lewis said, um, there are two types of people in the end. The ones that God, that said to God, let your will be done, or the ones that the Lord has to say to them, let your will be done, All right? So in other words, um, the lake of fire was not, intended for man. It was intended for the devil. And if you choose to be God's enemy, you can go where God's enemies go. It's your choice. It's your choice. 
So God exacted judgment on an evil society that had resisted his kindness, his grace, and his truth. So then we see verse 26, for Joshua kept holding out his spear until everyone had, had lived in Everyone who had lived in Ai was completely destroyed. So this was obedience to the Lord, as I, as I told you last week. You know, it, that wasn't in the original plan. All of a sudden, he's, he's prepared and he's heading out doing what God had said, but he's also prepared to listen in the midst of the battle to his commander. And that's the way our hearts should be. I need to read God's word and head out risk and all, to go listen to what God said, but I also have to listen as he reveals things to me through his word and in prayer where he says to me, um, Dave, I want you to go out. I want you to love your enemies. So then I start loving enemies, but then the Lord's like, okay, with this enemy, I want you to love them in this certain way. Okay. You know, so then it's like that spear thing. I hold out the spear and listen to the Lord. Joshua just listened. And um, I, I said last week, Joshua could have been like the type of people we like to be. And when we're in the heat of battle and a new command comes, we get a little bent out of shape because it is inconvenient right now. Right? You know, when the Lord revealed to me that, that people are more important than my carpet. I didn't like that revelation. I like my carpet, <laughs> right? But then the Lord told me years ago, this wasn't yesterday, so don't worry about it. Years ago, he said, what's more important, your carpet and that people may sometimes come in with their shoes and walk right across it or the people wearing those shoes, who's more important? And I have to say, I love you guys more than my carpet right? So, so the Lord reveals, this is how I want you to love. Like when he taught me to love when I was younger, right? Man, I loved my shoes, right? My Jordans. I spent a lot of money saving up to buy those shoes, right? Then I had all these little brothers that liked to borrow my shoes when I wasn't looking, right? They come in and their friends were like, yo, so-and-so, those Jordans are hot. And I'm like, those are my Jordans, what are you doing with them on? You know? And then the Lord taught me, do you love your little brothers? Yeah. So hold your things with open hands. Hold your things with open hands. Don't grip them. You own them. Those things don't own you. And you need to make that decision, Dave. Right? So I had to decide. Okay, well, I love my little brothers more than my shoes. You can wear my shoes, just don't scuff them. <laughs> and then when they scuff them, I have to say, all right, I love you more than, the, than you scuffing my shoes. Wear my shoes, just don't burn them. No, I, they didn't burn any. <laughs> it's all right, no. Um, yeah, the Lord reveals to us personally how he wants us to love, right? And, and, and it's a radical type of love, not crazy, not out of your mind. It, it needs to fit with God's word right? That's how I know I can test things before the Lord, right? If I, if I feel an, an inkling towards something, I can look and test it before the Lord and say, is this you speaking to me, Lord? Does this line up with your word? So, you know, we have that. And listen to how he loved them. Remember, they couldn't touch anything in Jericho. It is all the Lord's. And remember, like I said, that was like their first fruits, the first fruits, if you don't understand what the first fruits are, it's when Israel uh, would have their crops, the Lord said, the first crops coming off, give them to me, bring them to me, because I'm really hungry. No, that's not why. It was to show their trust in the Lord who had made their crops grow in the first place. So they brought those crops to the Lord, and then the Lord would see the beauty of their hearts and say, you trust me? And he would bless the rest of the crops. And he would allow them to have all the rest of it. All right? How kind is that? The one who made the crops grow in the first place. Right? So the first fruits. So he says pretty much, hey, that first 
town that you're going to take over, bring it all to me. Trust me. I'll take care of you. Then he lets them into Ai when they actually defeat it. And this is what he says. Only the livestock and the treasures of the town were not destroyed. For the Israelites kept these as plunder for themselves. As the Lord had commanded Joshua. Right? He said, all the nice little things in this town, you guys can have them. They're all yours. Great. So Joshua burned the town of Ai, and it became a permanent mound of ruins, desolate to this very day. Joshua impaled the king of Ai on a sharpened pole and left him there until evening. At sunset, the Israelites took down the body as Joshua commanded and threw it in front of the town gate. They piled a great heap of stones over him that can still be seen today. So we see this, this uh, victory, and that was also a sign of victory to the rest of the cities and towns, saying... What happened to this king is going to happen to you. We're coming with the Lord's judgment, right? And then they put him in front of that town, lay a big heap, and that heap would be a lasting monument on who God was, right? God brings victory. God overcomes our enemies. And even in our lives today, um, even in my own life, there are big heaps, right, of sins that the Lord helped me to conquer. So then when, you, when that sin comes as a temptation again, you can remember how it was conquered in the past, and you can say, nope, not today. That great king of that sin that tried to take over my life, the Lord took him out, and he's under a heap of stones, and I'm not coming, Right? God is good. It was a sign of uh, total humiliation and victory over the enemy. And by listening to the Lord's instruction, they turned their failure into victory. All right? You guys remember, if, you, if you've missed it, just read the beginning of chapter 8, and they trick the enemy by acting like, like the same thing is going on again through their failure. And they lure the enemy in, and they take him out. So then verse 30. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the most important thing to remember, right, for them. And this uh, I already taught on, so if you want to see what they were doing, jo um, Moses gave the instruction to this in Deuteronomy 27. So if you go back in the app and you want to read what all this was about, um, it's in Deuteronomy 27, and I... I think I took two weeks to teach through it all. So it'd be um, September, I think it was September 12th. They were, or no, September 17th, they were uploaded or something like that. But just look up De Deuteronomy 27. You'll be able to find the story and it'll tell you a bit more in depth of what they were doing. But uh, then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel on Mount Ebal. If you guys remember, there were the two mountains Half of Israel would go on one mountain. That would be the Mount of Blessing. The other mountain would be the Mount of Curses. And as, they, as the leaders were in the valley below, they would read out the blessings and they would answer back, that Israel would answer back, and they'd read out the curses and they would answer back. And the Lord was saying, listen, you need to keep to this. And if you don't keep to this, this will happen. And they would say as a testimony, amen, let it be so, right? So they, they were in there. It's almost like when we pray, or hopefully when we pray. Sometimes I pray with my children at night, and then I open my eyes to see them, and they're looking around, and they're playing, and I'm thinking of that. And I say to them, how are you even hearing what we're praying about? You're playing with the toy over there. And I'm like, Sorry, Daddy. <laughs> and then they close their eyes. But I think to myself, like, in some ways, I'm like, hey, guys, listen. And then in other ways, I'm like, I'm the same way right? You start praying and your mind starts drifting off. <laughs> You're somewhere else. You're in Bermuda, <laughs> sipping the non-alcoholic pina colada. <laughs> you know, we're in church right now. Come on. <laughs> so, um, you know, and our minds drift, right? The Lord was saying, the Lord was saying, like, in, in essence, these are the things. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
Yes, I hear what you're saying. And when I give instructions to my children, sometimes they're not paying attention. And I catch them and I say, what did I just say? Um, and some of them are really clever, right? They'll like give you the gist of something you were talking about. But you know, man, you weren't even listening. And then I say, look in my eyes and hear the instructions I'm giving you. And then when they hear them, I say, do you understand? Yes, daddy. You know, I, I actually require them to answer me and say, uh, you know, whatever, so-and-so, do not do this. Okay, daddy. We, we just had a transaction. A transaction happened. I deposited. They gave me the invoice and said the deposit made it in. <laughs> there's, there's something here. So the Lord is doing that with them. He followed the commands that Moses, the Lord's servant, had written in the book of instruction. Make me an altar from stones that are uncut and have not been shaped with iron tools. Then on the altar, they presented burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. And as the Israelites watch, jo watched, Joshua copied onto the stones of the altar. And we're, it's explained to us in Deuteronomy that he wasn't cutting them in. What he was doing is he put plaster on it. And this was actually normal in this day for kings of people to plaster stones and for, you know, somebody to write down the great things that the king had done during his reign. Guys, do you know that's why we have history back in the day? Why we know about certain kings and their exploits is because people carved it onto stone, or they plastered stones and then put the great exploits of the king. Now, listening, listen to what Joshua, the great general, is doing. He is not writing down his great exploits. He's writing down the exploits of his king, God Almighty. That is important. One, we see humility. Because Joshua could have written down whatever he wanted. He was in control. And then we see that in this, it would remind the children of Israel of who God was. And the covenant that they made with the Lord. And that they needed to follow. Right? Right? So he followed the commands that Moses, the Lord's servant. Now, listen, at this point, he could have been like, you know what? Moses has been dead. I don't need to do what Moses told me to do. I'm my own man, right? How many of us would do that? Come on, let's be honest. Let's be honest. How many of us would do that? I'm not listening to what, you know, my old leader told me to do. I'm the leader now. Who led in the victory of Jericho, right? Was it Moses? No, it was me, Joshua, right? Who then corrected what these silly people did and then beat up AI and took it all? Joshua, right? And then he could have had like a choir that like constantly said his name, right? Joshua, thank you, thank you very much. That's what I would normally think would happen. And then you'd see it all over Instagram and Facebook and, you know, TikTok and all, every social media um, channel that we have. And then, and then the news, the reporters would go, look at this great general, you know? Now that's today. Joshua didn't do anything like that. He worshiped the Lord who he knew gave him victory. Hey, guys. Let me ask you, do you do that in your life? When he, the Lord is bringing great things to your life, when he's bringing great victory, or are you like, the Lord is good? Or are you like, let me tell you the secret 13 steps of my success. <laughs> let me write a book, right? Let's be honest. Are we like Joseph who when he was brought out of prison and Pharaoh said to him, I heard that you can tell the meaning of dreams. What does Joshua say? Well, thank you for letting me out. I am your man. <laughs> no. J 
Joshua says, I, great Pharaoh, cannot tell the meaning of dreams, but my God can tell the meaning of dreams, right? Giving honor to the Lord right away. So Joseph was able to do that. Sorry, did I say Joshua? I know when you're throwing around all these names, (laughs) you should try it sometime. Someday I'll sit there and you can teach (laughs) and we'll just throw out all biblical names for you. (laughs) Yes, Joseph was able to say, no, great Pharaoh, it's not me. It's the Lord. Who else did that? Daniel, right? When the king, guys, if you, under, if you look at history, Daniel served under the most powerful king on earth to date. Why, why would I say that? Because Nebuchadnezzar was allowed to do anything he wanted. There was no law that was higher than the king. Now, you might say, oh, well, you know, there's other kings that were greater, richer, or whatever. No, no. What I mean is he had ultimate power. If he said to his armies, which he had many armies at his disposal, if he said to his armies, we're going to go take out this land, there was no one to say, "Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, I don't think that's a good idea. We're not going to do that. Nobody stopped him. You guys remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He says, listen, I'm tired of these guys. Make that furnace seven times hotter. So hot that his men die. There was no one there to say, I don't think that's a good idea, Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Because he was the most powerful. That's why in the vision, Nebuchadnezzar is the golden head. God gave him so much power. And the Lord said, I let you rule the earth That even the animals of the fields came for food to you. And the Lord took that power away. For seven years, he wandered on the earth eating grass. Right? And then it's Nebuchadnezzar who comes and gives a testimony and says, the Lord's kingdom never ends. Right? But we see that when Daniel came before this great king, what did Daniel say? Right? My God can tell you your dream. He didn't say, I'm pretty good. I have my own YouTube channel, right? No, he said, my God can tell you your dreams. My God can reveal it. Are we like that? Are we like Joshua? Are we like Daniel? Are we like Joseph? Are we like Jesus? who constantly gave glory to God the Father. And it says that it was his glory to have, but he didn't care. He was obedient even unto death. That's why we see Joshua as a picture of who Jesus is for us. Joshua was obedient to a master that he knew followed God, And showed him the true God. So if Moses gave him something to do, he fulfilled it. He did it. He said, I was charged with something. I was anointed to do something. And I'm going to do it. And I'm going to be obedient as I do it. I'm going to perk up my ears to listen to God's voice as I do it. Now, am I saying that Joshua was perfect? No, we're going to read soon that he wasn't perfect. But listen... We read about his mess up, and if that was his only mess up, I want to live like Joshua. Right? Make me an altar from stone, so he does it. And the other thing is this. The Lord says, hey, listen, don't, don't, I don't want them cut stones or anything like that. Just make an altar of stones. Just build it up. And sometimes as humans, we also have this, this ability to make beautiful things, and that thing is worshipped, and not the God that gave those beautiful things, right? And then we come in, and well, look at this beautiful building. I mean, I've been there too, right? You go to a church, and it is beautiful, and you say, did you see their beautiful building? I mean, think of the, the disciples. When they passed by the temple, and they said to Jesus, this temple is beautiful, isn't it? And Jesus is like, meh. It's 
It's all right. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be a day coming where one stone won't be on top of another, but, you know, if that's, that's your thing. You know, that's my paraphrased version. And we have this, this knack to make beautiful things and to forget, forget about the Lord who gave us the beautiful things, the beautiful one, right? And the Lord's like, it's not going to be like that. Just make an altar and remember that I am the beautiful one that you worship. Then all the Israelites, foreigners and native-born alike, along with the elders, officers, and judges, were divided into two groups. One group stood in front of Mount Gerizim, the other in front of Mount Ebal. Each group faced the other, and between them stood the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. This was all done according to the commands that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had previously given for blessing the people of Israel. Joshua then read to them all the blessings and curses Moses had written in the book of instruction. Every word of every command that Moses had ever given was read to the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. So they were obedient. And the Lord marks down many paragraphs when they are obedient. To magnify it for us so that we see that obedience is good. I'll leave you with this last story. When um, my firstborn, who she'll be 10 years old on Tuesday, and I remember when she was two, right? And um, the neighbor was out, and Emily, who was the only daughter I had at that time, was walking away, and she liked to sneak through the hedge into the neighbor's garden because she thought, you know, anything that isn't mine is wondrous, right? Yeah, it's wonderful over here. So then I called her over and she was always obedient and she would come back over and, and then I said to her, and the neighbor heard me and I said, Emily, I don't want you to go to the other side. I need you to obey daddy. And then I heard the neighbor laugh. Like, not like he he, like <laughs> and I turned and looked. And she was like, did you just say obey? And I said, yeah. She's like, you expect your children to obey you. That's so old fashioned. It's like, you better not step foot in my house. You're going to be obeying too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just thought, isn't that, isn't that the world? Right? The Lord tells us, hey, teach your children in the way they should go. And the world's like, nah, just let them be. And then the world's like, what's wrong with my children? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they had no instruction. I don't know. Maybe they weren't taught there's authority. <laughs> you know, when I walk by and a little kid calls me a name and you think, are you okay in the head? You know I'm bigger than you, right? <laughs> Not that I would do anything, but I know growing up in New York City, I never called somebody bigger than me a name. <laughs> I don't know what that person has in their pocket. It's probably not going to be gum. <laughs> you know? And you think by just teaching obedience, you keep children safe. Right? And the Lord was trying to say to Israel, I want to keep you safe. So just listen to me. And I will bring you success. I will give you the things that you long for if you just follow me, if you are just obedient. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we want to be obedient, Lord. Even as adults, we want to be obedient to you, Lord. But Lord, we war with ourselves, we war with the system of this world, and we war with the enemy. So Lord, we pray that you would empower us to be obedient through your Holy Spirit that we would follow after you, that we would live out what we learn, that we would apply it to our lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.